Now I hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us <clears throat> from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, <clears throat> they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised, he is not here. Look, this is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. <clears throat> so they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark was the first gospel written, and it ends with the women running away in fear. Nothing said about any appearance of Jesus after his death. Later writers were uncomfortable with that, and so they added several endings to the gospel of Mark. Yet Mark apparently knew nothing of the resurrection. So what does resurrection really mean? For most Christians, the resurrection is the foundational experience in their faith journey. Resurrection is the root of many of the metaphors, new life, rebirth, renewal, that best describe the traumatic and dramatic transformation of beliefs, values, ways of being in community that define the Christian pilgrimage of faith. Having said that, what does resurrection really mean? For many people who gather on this day to celebrate resurrection, the meaning has never entered their minds. The church and scripture established that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that was simply that. But for others, the stories don't ring true. They agree with scholars who say that the passion narratives were written largely to refute lies. One lie said that Jesus never died. Another, that his body was stolen. To refute such lies, three Gospels presented graphic details about the final days. Events, words, eyewitnesses, wounds, death, linen wrappings, missing body, palpable appearances. The details differ, but the evangelist's intent is clear. Leave no room for lies that could discredit Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. What the gospel writers neglected to understand is that the aim of faith isn't to affirm data, but to grasp its meaning. The eye of faith must see the cross and linen wrappings and tomb and go beyond them. So is it possible to believe in resurrection without believing that Jesus was physically raised from the dead? What rings true for me is the answer my biblical theology professor gave when asked about resurrection. He said no one can prove that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. What I do know is that a small band of followers were empowered by something to spread the message of Jesus to the world. Something. Empowered by something. This much we do know. 
A small group of followers didn't remain in hiding, though it made all the sense in the world that they should have. Those who followed Jesus were horrified and terrified by his death. The possibility that they too might be rounded up and executed had to have been on their minds. The biblical stories reveal that few people wanted to admit that they were even acquainted with Jesus. One story told in all four Gospels is Peter's denial. This isn't a detail you'd normally share. It's a detail about which you would be ashamed. Unless such a detail supports the fact that something subsequently happened to negate the denial. And it did. Something happened that caused Peter and Jesus' other followers to change from a timid and frightened group who had denied and fled and hidden when the going got tough to a group of disciples who were willing to give up their lives to follow the message of Jesus. What happened is that they finally got it. Somewhere along the way, between Palm Sunday and today, the message of Jesus finally traveled the 18 inches from their heads to their hearts. Was it caused by their realization that Jesus didn't have to march into Jerusalem? Was it watching Jesus die with a word of, without a word of wrath spoken against those who tortured and killed him? Most followers, of course, didn't watch. They were all ready in hiding, except for the women and John who had followed all the way to Golgotha, unable to abandon this man upon whom all their hopes lay. Perhaps it happened later when the finality of his death sunk into their psyches. It's impossible to say precisely at what moment they understood the message. All that matters is that they did. A man might be dead, but his message lived on. And with that realization, this small group of disciples, for now they really were disciples and not just followers, were set on fire in ways they had never been before. In short, they experienced resurrection. They discovered new life. They found a relationship with the living Lord. And with that, they found the courage and the peace and the joy that they ha didn't have to wait for, but that they could simply reach down and take hold of like a precious treasure buried beneath their feet. It was a life that had been with them all along. They just hadn't grasped it before. It was the good news called resurrection. The one who, it, who gave it was the same one who had shown them in spades what it meant to claim your dignity as a human being in the face of all the horror that life can possibly throw at you. And just as surely as he had come out of the tomb, Jesus was alive for them. Their crushed hopes and shattered dreams were transformed into a new vision, for they finally understood what Jesus was trying to tell them all along. His message was his life, so much so that he was willing to die for it. And with that realization, with the birth of his message in their hearts and souls, they could finally proclaim, he is risen. The reason why every gospel writer has the women at the tomb 
proclaiming the good news is that the women were there through the agonizing crucifixion. In that time with him, watching him die, they no doubt struggled with why anyone would suffer such a death for no reason. They knew that all Jesus had to do was back off, soften his message a little, leave Jerusalem to the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, and go off into the hill country, and he could have saved his life. They knew that. So why didn't he do it? Why would Jesus suffer the worst form of death unless he felt that what he was doing was absolutely essential? And after the woman helped wrap his bruised and broken dead body, they kept wondering why. Why did he do this? And somewhere, somehow, in the next few days, the answer came to them. There was no other way. The message he had shared with them about God's love and God's compassionate caring for all human beings wasn't a message that could be compromised. If you weren't willing to share it and live it, either even under the threat of death, then it hadn't taken hold in your being. His death meant that his message still lived, and so did he. What I think all of us need to realize is that whether we accept the traditional resurrection story of the one we call the Christ, or a different rendering, there was a resurrection. If there had not been the fledgling group of people who followed Jesus, who were known as followers of the way, would simply have faded off into oblivion like so many other religious cults. And here one day and gone the next. No, something happened, and that is an indisputable fact. It's the same sort of thing that needs to happen in our own lives. It's one thing to know the stories of our religious tradition, it's one thing to be brought up in the church. It's one thing to be baptized and follow all the ritual and tradition that a particular church espouses. But unless the message of Jesus reaches your heart and soul and gut, none of that matters. The message either comes alive for you and in you, or all the rest is just form and no substance. And the proof of that is evident in the many people who call themselves Christians, who light lead lives that they don't support that. For them, the resurrection really has never happened. Jesus didn't die for the sake of a story or for an institution. Jesus died for humanity because there was no other way. Jesus died for people like me and you, people whom the world would reduce to data, to marketing opportunities, to cannon fodder, to revenue streams, but whom God always knows by name. Remember the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus about being born anew? Conservative churches have co-opted the term and given it a particular meaning, but Jesus used it differently. It's not about having a religious fervor, it's about transformation and resurrection, about living your life as Jesus did, about having his message so deeply embedded in your psyche and in your being that you can't imagine living without it. 
When we do that, Jesus is resurrected all over again. And if that isn't a message worth proclaiming, I don't know what is. Resuscitation brings someone back. Resurrection launches you forward. If Jesus were resuscitated, one thing's for certain. He didn't stick around very long. Have you ever wondered why? He knew his followers hadn't understood his message while he was traveling with them around the countryside. So why didn't he stay with them and try to help them understand it better? I think because he realized his death said it all. It said, God's message is so much a part of me that I'd rather die than give it up. That's what the disciples had never understood. Jesus wasn't simply a healer. He wasn't simply a teacher. He wasn't simply a prophet. He was a messenger from God, proclaiming to the world through his life and through his death, that nothing, not sin, not illness, not gender, not sexual orientation, not social status, not any restriction established by religious hierarchies, not even death, could separate a person from the love of God. It remains the primary proclamation that God has been trying to share with the world since the beginning of time. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God had spoken it centuries before. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Isaiah also proclaimed it. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Even the author of Lamentations understood the message. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of God never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They were new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What part of this didn't the followers of Jesus understand? What part of this don't we understand? If the excruciating death of a man on a cross doesn't convince us that his message said it all, what will convince us? What makes this message so difficult to understand is that it goes against everything we human beings have decided makes sense. We say, I'll love you if you're good. We say, I'll love you if you love me. Or goodness should be rewarded and sinfulness punished. We decided that this is the way it should be, except that if it were, we would be left high and dry. For we don't love our neighbors as ourselves, and we don't love God with all our heart and our soul and our mind. And heaven knows we probably sin way more than we'd like to admit. It's hard to believe something that doesn't make sense. But there was a group of frightened and timid disciples who finally understood when their hearts were sealed up in a tomb with their beloved teacher, that nothing, absolutely nothing, could separate them from him and from the love of God. It's the something that caused them to proclaim, he is risen. A person's life isn't negated by death. Who we are, and what we stand for transcends our bodily existence. What the disciples of Jesus realized was that they didn't need Jesus anymore. 
because what was essential about him remained with them, God's message of love and grace. All people matter to God. There are no exceptions. All that love is endures. That is truly good news. That is resurrection. Amen.